Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to this week's edition of Advanced Bass Fishing, and thanks a lot for swinging by, checking out the video. Always uh, definitely grateful for that. Guys, today we're gonna be talking about wacky rigging. I'm gonna give you guys an advanced wacky rigging tutorial, a really good seminar on it, and I um, think this is gonna add up to a lot of really good fish for you guys. If you haven't fished a wacky rig, or even if you have fished it, uh, we're getting close to wacky rig season. It's about another month away, so this is gonna be a good sort of a prep course, you know, for the upcoming season. Um, what we're going to do in today's video, guys, is we're going to break it up in three parts. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to show you the wacky rigs that I like as far as the uh, type of baits that I use. We'll talk about colors, profiles, that type of stuff, the hooks, all that, everything, how to set it up, and why certain ones work under certain conditions. And then, then we'll take a break and we'll get into the equipment that you throw it on. And then exactly how you want to manipulate a wacky rig, how you want to put the action on it, because there's quite a few different ways that you can actually work a wacky rig. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the type of areas to throw it in towards the end of the video there. So it's gonna be a good little seminar here. Also guys, just real quick, the housekeeping tip for our advanced bass fishing. Just want to uh, invite everybody out there. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe to the channel, I'd really appreciate that. If you could hit that subscribe button, that helps out. And also guys, um, if you guys want, I'll, I'll link the my wacky rig setup in the description of the video through my tackle warehouse links. And if you guys want to get some of this stuff or if you want to order any of their fishing tackle, the one of the best ways you can support the advanced bass fishing channel here is to use my tackle warehouse link and bookmark it for your fishing purchases. And that's uh, much appreciated there. <clears throat> okay, guys, so let me give you a little, um, little background on this first and talk a little bit about the technique before we get into it. Um, wacky rigging has been around for quite a, quite a few, uh, quite a long time. I mean, it's not any, it's not a new technique or anything like that. But I think what has changed specifically over the past five years or so is the variations in the bait selections and the colors and the understanding about how it's more effective in a broad range of situations than we thought it was, it was before. Um, initially, people just thought wacky rigging was a good way to catch them when the fish were up shallow spawning. And that is one of the best ways to catch them, but there's a lot of other ways that you can catch, catch fish on wacky rigs that we're gonna go over in today's video. Okay, I'm gonna, first of all, guys, I wanna run over the my favorite wacky rig lures. And then I'll talk a little bit about colors and why it. Now there's there's three or four different primary lure, you know, profiles and, and uh, sizes and colors I use. But the first one is just the soft plastic uh, five or six inch stick bait. Um, this is the Zoom's Linky. A lot of guys like the Yamamoto Cinco, that works really good. This is probably the most well-known wacky rig and bait out there. Um, it's really effective because, you know, you can throw it quite a long ways. It's got some bulk to it. Uh, the size and the profile of the bait appeals both to numbers of fish and, uh, you know, big fish out there. And this is a, a really good setup for a, a wide range of situations, especially when the fish are a little bit more aggressive on a wacky rig. Um, but this is, if I'm guessing most people, this is what they throw all the time. They don't really throw any other thing besides that. Now the next one guys is a smaller four inch model. Um, this is the four inch uh, Cinco here, Yamamoto Cinco next to the, the uh, five inch uh, the Zooms Linky here. Now the four inch also has a really nice application and we'll talk about it a little bit more as far as when I like to use it, but this is a more of a finesse approach with it. Um, a lot of times I'll use this when those fish are a lot more finicky, if the water's really clear, um, fishing's a little bit tougher, bright, sunny skies, I'll downsize to the little four inch size. And then um, the uh, other one profile is the trick worm, the zoom trick worm, which is just a smaller profile lure like this. Now again, the trick worm, when you use a smaller profile, it's even for a more finesse approach. It's usually, again, for a really, really shallow water if those fish are like in less than three foot of water, or again, if you have tough fishing conditions, really clear water, um, and also the uh, trick worm works really good around grass for some reason. And then um, a couple other situations there um, we're gonna talk about. One of the other ones I like here is a bright colored uh, floating worm. Like it's a floating worm, but you rig racky, and we'll talk about colors here in a second. Um, a really downsized finesse one. This is a zoom finesse worm. You know, it's very similar to the to the trick worm, except it's about like an inch longer. Again, super finessey, shallow water. And then finally, uh, wacky rigging a craw, like the zoom uh, little critter craw. A lot of people don't do that, but we'll talk about wacky rigging a craw also in the video. 
those are my basic profiles with that. Now, the times, as far as how you choose a profile, you know, whether you want to use like the full size Cinco or the four inch or the, uh, you know, trick worm or something like that, it depends completely on the mood and the personality of the fish and the scenario that you're looking for as far as the weather conditions and um, sort of the stage that the fish are in. Overall, like I said, day in and day out, if you're just casting a wacky rig <clears throat> around shallow cover, the, the five or six inch stick bait is gonna be the deal. Another time that the bulkier stick bait like this, the five or six inch model works pretty good, is if you want to fish a little bit deeper. Now, one of a really good technique to fish a, a wacky rig as far as you know the, the stick bait is fishing it like a little bit deeper. So if you're fishing, say for example, you think there's some fish on a main lake point in 10 feet of water or so, you can catch them on a wacky rig there and the, and the Cinco style bait or the, the larger uh, soft plastic stick bait, it tends to fall a little bit faster because it's heavier. And also sometimes you can put a little nail weight in it, just a little piece of a nail, and it'll also sink it down. The fishing a little bit deeper or fishing it around grass beds is specifically really good. Um, if you got some submergent hydrilla or milfoil or something like that, the soft plastic stick bait with the bulk and the heaviness of it is really good to fish around those grass beds. And also the bigger, larger size uh, stick bait like that is effective if you have a little bit more off-colored water. Now, one of the things that you'll find out about off-colored water, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the end of the video, is that a, a wacky rig is really good in off-colored water, especially if you got some warm water. A lot of people consider it just like a clear water bait, but depending upon the color wacky rig you use and how you dye it up and that type of stuff, it can be effective down into water visibilities of 12 or 15 inches. And that's another time that the, the traditional size works good because a little bit more bulk and they can find it a little bit better in that, that off-colored water. Now, the four inch one, guys, the, the little the four inch soft plastic stick bait, um, here again, this is the, when you're talking about the smaller downsized worms, there's a lot of different scenarios they work in. Now, my favorite situation for the four inch one is if the fish are really shallow and the water's really clear. And especially if those fish are up shallow, close to the bedding time. There's just something about downsizing, you're gonna catch a lot more fish when those fish are, you know, up sort of looking for nests or actually nesting or guarding fry or something like that. You know, the little four inch size is gonna work really good. And also the four inch size, the times that I use it is usually on lakes that have a little bit more heavy fishing pressure. And normally it's those days that you don't have hardly any wind, it's bright sky, um, you know, just tougher fishing conditions where it's just generally harder to get a bite. You can, you can downsize and you still have the bulk of the larger stick bait uh, profile. It's the same, it's the bulk and the diameter of the bait is the same as the five or six inch model, but the length of it, you know, just gets you more bites in those tough situations. Now, when I go to the trick worm like this, the trick worm is for, uh, number one, no wind. It's like when I downsize to a smaller diameter worm, like either the you know regular seven inch zoom trick worm or the zoom finesse worm, which is a little bit lighter, this is a situation where I'm, I'm really trying to sneak up into these fish into really clear, usually shallow water, it can have grass or rock or whatever. But this is gonna be when those fish are spooky and wary and hard to catch. Um, the different, the biggest difference that you're going to notice in fishing the, the trick worm versus the soft plastic stick bait is the rate of fall. The rate of fall on the trick worm is going to be about half the amount as the soft plastic stick bait, simply because of the bulk of the bait. So the times that I'm wanting the smaller diameter worm, like the trick worm, is when I want that super, super fall, slow fall. And usually I want that in really shallow water. So if I've got bass that I know they're in like, you know, one to three foot of water, a lot of times this is my, my choice, you know, for that simply because it's just more diminutive, a little bit more subtle, that type of stuff. And uh, fish just bite it better in those situations. And then um, the uh, other one here, the last one here, as far as the craw goes. Now the craw is really, really good, again, when those fish are close to bedding. It's like you can take, um, I'll just, I'll go over the rigging here in a little bit with it, but you can take the crawl like this and just rig it wacky like this, fish it with no weight. And when those fish are close to spawning or they're up looking for beds, 
Uh, not that I encourage catching fish off of visible beds, I don't, but when those fish are in that zone where there are a bunch of fish up shallow, sometimes that little crawl can work really good in and around the bedding times. Okay, now that's a little bit about the profile, just a, a brief summary on that. Let's talk about colors on it, because colors are also really important in a, in a wacky rig. Now, one of the, um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of people make when they're wacky rigging is they just go with green pumpkin or watermelon all the time, they, and they call it good. I'm gonna say, guys, that probably 75 to 80% of the people that have fish wacky rigs or fish wacky rigs, all they do is throw the stick bait, five or six inch stick bait, in a green pumpkin or a watermelon and they just call it good and if they catch them fine if they don't fine that is a tremendous limitation there the this is one of the best baits in a, in a wide range of conditions as far as the color when you're talking about green pumpkin or watermelon like this it works good in a wide range of conditions it works good in clouds it works good in clear water sunny days it's just all around the fish like it and i'm not saying it's it's not the one to use a lot because it does catch a lot of fish but the, the strength of the green pumpkin and the watermelon is its versatility in a wide range of sunlight conditions and water clarities. And even a lot of what a lot of people do is like if the water is a little bit off colored, like two foot visibility, you can dye up the tails with some chartreuse on them and it, they stand out a little bit more. But um, really, really good versatile color is the green pumpkin and the watermelons. Now, my personal ones that I use a lot more guys are more of a shad pattern, like um, this is the, like, a, like a smoke or salt and pepper, or something like this. These don't get fished very much. And any type of a shaddy smoke pattern like this that has some translucent in it like that, this is really, really good, again, in that clear water, bright sunlight conditions out there. So, um, and another thing about the four inch guys, it falls fairly decent, it falls faster than a trick worm, so you can fish it down a little bit deeper. But the difference between using like a green pumpkin versus a shad pattern, would be if I've got um, really clear water, like water visibilities of over you know, four or five foot and some type of bright skylight conditions with not much wind. And uh, again, I can work this thing down into five or 10 foot of water with the rate that it falls on there. Now, the other ones, guys, the other colors that I use are what I call the bright uh, obnoxious colors. So something like this pearl laminate like here, you know, that's a little bit, you know, stands out real good or like a white or a chartreuse trick worm. Now guys, these are excellent lures to use as far as the bright colors like this in two different situations. The bright colors are really, really good to catch fish around boat docks. If you got fish suspended around boat docks or using boat docks or something about it, works really, really good. But the other time that I use them again is when those fish are up in that bedding mode and when they're either you know, looking to make beds, they're building beds, they're bedding, or they're garden fry. When those fish are in and around the nest, they can't stand these bright, wacky rigged, um, uh, you know, like what most people would do with the floating worm. And there's a different way to rig them too. I mean, a different way to, uh, to uh, work them. We're gonna talk about here in a second here. And then, um, like I said, there's some other colors out there. Occasionally, guys, I'll use something like a June bug or black and blue, especially if I'm fishing in some type of a tannic water acid like in Florida. But for the most part, I either use, you know, some type of a shad pattern or the traditional green pumpkin watermelon and under those specific situations, a real bright color. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick break here, guys, and then we're gonna get back. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to rig the wacky rigs, and then we're gonna get into the uh, uh, technique as far as the equipment to use on them and how to manipulate and work it. So I'll be right back. Okay guys, we're back. Now we're gonna get into how to rig a wacky rig, uh, talk a little bit about some modifications and how do you wanna fish it as far as imparting action on it. Now the first thing I wanna tell you not to do with a wacky rig, because most people that fish wacky rigs do this and it's not the right way, is stop using the collar like this. You see everybody out there putting their collar around their wacky rig, hooking the hook parallel to the worm like this. This is not how you wanna do it. The only reason people do this is that they think they're gonna save a few worms with it. But in doing so, you're gonna lose more fish and you're going to not get as many strikes with that. Because number one is, since it's a clear water bait for the most part, every single piece of hardware you have besides the worm is a strike detractor. And that little collar right there, even though it's subtle, that's something that can take away strikes. So I'd never use a collar. And then I never hook it like that because when this worm is falling, 
you've got that worm falling and that hook is like that, which is not in the ideal position. So stop doing it like this. The way that you wanna rig your worms, guys, is just without a collar, I'm gonna take the same worm here and I'm just going to hook it in the middle, just like that. This is the way to rig a, rig a, rack, a, wig a, rig a wacky rig. And a lot of times, you, you know, I like to hook it in the center, but it doesn't matter sometimes. You can get it off to the side a little bit. Um, then you don't have to be perfect with that, but just try to get it right through the middle of it and you hook it like that. <clears throat> Number one with this, the reason this is better is that you don't have that visual deterrent. You know, you've eliminated that. And when the wacky rig falls through the water, it's falling like this. So when that fish comes up and grabs it, you set the hook and it gets them right through the roof of the mouth every time with that. So that is the way that you want to rig it. And also guys, the hooks on them. Um, I have talked with a lot of the best wacky riggers in the world. I've experimented myself. I consider David Dudley one of the best wacky riggers in the world. And he's the one that got me using a straight shank hook for a wacky rig many, many years ago. A lot of people use those, those little octopus hooks and those little small hooks. Guys, this is the hook you wanna use. This is a Gamagatsu G Finesse one aught a heavy cover worm hook. Um, I'll link everything in the description here. This is the hook that works the best. You know, it's pretty, even though it's exposed, it's pretty weedless. You don't really get hung up even fishing it around cover. It will, but you don't fish a wacky rig in heavy cover. Anyway, if I do sometimes have to fish it in super heavy cover, I will use a weedless hook, but 95% of the time, this is a setup I use. And you don't wanna to go too big with the hook. The one aught hook is the hook to use with it, regardless of the bait that you're using. Even if you're, even if you're using the bigger stick bait like this, the one aught hook will still catch more fish. Now, a lot of this has to do with the diameter of the hook, and you're usually using spinning tackle. So the small diameter and the small barb on this hook gives you better penetration. You don't want a bigger hook because you need that small diameter of a wire for the best penetration with the lighter tackle that you're normally using. So this is the, the way to hook it with the best, the best uh, hook on there. Now, the next modification I do, guys, this is a really important one also, and we've talked about this in some of the other ones. You have to rough these up because take a look at this now. See how this thing bends like this? Look, look at the angle of the bend. Now, watch what happens when you break the saw up. Most all of these soft plastic uh, stick baits have, you know, they're pretty heavily sawed, especially the Yamamoto's. The Yamamoto's have a lot of salt in them and they fall a little bit quicker, but there's two things that happen once you break it up. It's gonna be more pliable and lifelike, and then it changes the color to a more natural look. The, the color, it changes in, in, in a way that you just can't really resemble it in any other way. So look at the two there versus the, the way that it's set up there. See how it's just a little bit more limber like that? And what happens is when you're fishing it, if it's done right, if you, if you break the salt up right, when this wacky rig has fallen through the water, both of these tips will start vibrating like that on the way down, you know, especially if it's falling a little bit faster. And by breaking the salt up in there, you're gonna get a lot more action on that bait. And it just changes the appearance of it. Any of the soft plastic stick baits that are heavily salted, doesn't matter if it's a green pumpkin or, or any type of a shad pattern out there, um, it gives it like a beat up look. It gives it like a wounded look. And that's the first thing I do. It's like that, one, that is at the top of my list is breaking that salt up in there, you know, before you use it every single time out there. Okay, now as far as working the bait, let's talk a little bit about the tackle, how you want to work it. Um, I use the same spinning tackle that I do with my jerk baits. I use the Mega Bass uh, Whip Snake Spinning Rod. It's a six foot, 11 inch uh, medium action spinning rod. Usually I have a 3000 series spinning reel on it. Uh, most of the time I'm using eight pound test Seaguar and Vizex line. Sometimes I will go to 10 pound test if I'm fishing, uh, say the water's a little bit more off colored and I don't have to make a long cast with it. Um, if I'm using the stick bait though, the, you know, the, the regular larger stick bait, uh, eight to 10 pound test, just depending upon how heavy the cover is, that type of situation. If I'm skipping the thing like up underneath boat docks or if I'm fishing it around the grass edges where I'm making shorter casts with it, I'll go with 10 straight fluorocarbon, not braid the fluorocarbon. And then if I'm fishing it more like just down open banks, I'll use the eight. Now the times that I, I do use six is if I'm fishing like the little finesse worms like that, 
um, in op more open water, like gravelly, rocky banks. If the water's real clear, I real I will go down into six simply because it gives you a little bit a um, little bit farther cast and just a little bit better feel with it. So there's a couple different ways that you work the, the wacky rig based upon what you're trying to accomplish with it. I'll sort of show you here. The first way is, you know, you can cast it out there, let it, let it hit the bottom, or when you, first of all, when you cast it out there, just shake the tip of your rod a little bit like that. It, it, I just think it does a little bit more to it. So I cast it out there, I'm shaking it like that, I'm letting it fall, usually on a slack line, so it'll go straight down. I'm watching my line to make sure, you know, when it hits the bottom, my line's gonna go slack across the surface. And once it hits the bottom, guys, I'll just sort of like pull it up like that and shake it almost like a shaky head. And I only work it probably, and this is one of the big keys with wacky rigging. Once I know that bait is on the bottom, I'm only gonna work it probably three to five feet. And then I'm gonna reel in and make another cast. Because what you're gonna find in most wacky rig situations, the fish either hit it on the way down or they hit it as soon as it hits the bottom or they hit it as soon as you start working it. You don't, one of the things about a wacky rig that will save you a lot of time that you can catch more fish is don't cast that thing out there, you know, 40 or 50 foot in front of the boat and feel like you gotta work it all the way back to the boat because you don't. Um, take advantage of the, the entire concept of it, which is a visual strike and just, you know, look for that strike to come from either on the way down or when you first work that. Don't you don't ever have to work it over five feet. And um, a lot of times I don't, I, you don't really have to do much to it. It's like, it's like once it does hit the bottom, I'll just shake it like sort of try to keep it in one place. And occasionally I'll work it maybe like a foot and then I'll pop it hard like that to try to get it popping off the bottom. To, and sometimes that'll get a reaction strike with them. Now that's how I work it in most situations, except for the fact when I'm using a brighter colored floating worm. Now, when you're using a bright colored floating worm, you don't want the bait to go down to the bottom with it. What you wanna do with the bright floating worm is you cast it out there, and as soon as it hits the bottom, let it sink maybe an inch or two, and then just start shaking your rod and reeling it like that, all the way to the back to the boat. You don't want it to go to the bottom. You wanna keep it high up in the water column. So what's happening is it's almost like a floating worm Wigged, rigged wacky style. So this thing is going like this. Well, it's hard to show, but it's going like this, just underneath the water like that. But you don't want to give them a good chance to look at a bright one. So that's why you want to keep it moving fast, just under the water. And this is one of the most exciting strikes out there because you can see these fish come up and get it just like they would a floating worm. Um, and the, the dock fish is the same way too, guys. One of the things about on docks, is if I'm using you know the bait around there, a lot of times I'll dead stick it. If you've got a uh, piece of cover, like a piling or a stump or something like that, where it's an obvious piece of structure where you think there's gonna be a fish around, just throw it out there, you know, let it sink to, let it sink to the bottom around that area and just leave it. Just let it set for probably 15 or 20 seconds and then maybe shake it like that. And a lot of times if those fish are holding around that object, you know, they really respond well to the dead sticking with that. But um, it's simple, <laughs> that's the thing about it. A wacky rig is super, super simple to fish. It's not real complicated. Um, there are a couple techniques like we talked about as far as, as far as working it, but you really can't go wrong is if you fish it slow. You got to, one, one of the biggest things about a wacky rig is you have to slow your pace down because you can't, you can't um, fish it fast. You have to let it, you have to give it time to go down and time to sink down, which takes, you know, it can take some time occasionally. It is more important to have a slow fall if you're in clear water, because if you're in, if you're in real clear water, that slow fall will give the fish a chance to pick up on it visually more. If you're in a little bit off, more off colored water, that super, super slow fall isn't quite as important because normally in the more off colored water, they're going to hit it on the bottom. Like as soon as you start moving it, but I'm gonna guess if I'm in water visibility that is over four or five, six foot clarity, um, most of the fish that I catch on it, they get it before it hits the bottom. They usually get it like within a foot or two off the bottom. So that's why it's really important to have that slow rate, slow rate of fall on it. Um, 
that, and that, that just takes, it takes an adjustment because it, say for example, if you're fishing down a bank with a shaky head, a shaky head with an eighth ounce sinker on it, you can fish it 10 times faster with, with, than a wacky. If you're fishing a wacky, you know, it doesn't matter what, which one it is. When you cast out there in five to 10 feet of water, it's gonna take you, it's gonna, you're gonna have to sit there and let it sink for probably 10 seconds before you do anything. So have that shift in your mind that, you know, keep your trolling motor on low, try to make long casts unless you're just fishing around targets and just slow everything down. You, you've, got, you've got to slow down to a snail's pace once that you know there's some fish in an area out there. You can't, you're gonna fish over so many fish if you try to fish it too fast. And a lot of times your bait's not gonna be on the bottom. Um, so that's gonna be a big factor too. Now, wind is another factor too, because uh, a wacky rig is very difficult to fish in the wind. Uh, a couple tips that I'll give you for that, if they are biting with that, is number one, always try to fish with the wind. Don't ever try to cast your wacky rig like into the wind or at a 45 into the wind because it's going to drift back to you. If you can position your boat where you can make the cast in front of the boat, the fall is gonna be a lot more natural if you cast with that wind. And sometimes, you, like I said, you can put a little, you know, lead nail weight, just a little piece in there, and it'll, you know, help you if it's super, super windy with that. But anyway, that's a pretty bit simple on the rigging to deal with that. Um, take a quick break, and then we're gonna get into the meat of the video, talk about where you wanna fish it and uh, seasonal patterns with them. So we'll be right back. Okay guys, we're back for the final segment here. We're gonna talk about the uh, seasonal patterns and the areas that you need to look for, uh, places you wanna fish a wacky rig throughout the year. Now, a lot of this, this is sort of gonna be wide ranging because the uh, structure and the, the patterns that exist within wacky rig and largely depends on the type of lake that you have. If there's grass in it, you know, the predominant cover, rock, wood, docks, that type of stuff. But first of all, let's take the winter out of it because I have never done hardly anything on wacky rigs in the winter time. I'm not saying you can't catch a fish on them. <clears throat> I'm sure that you could in certain situations. But for me, the wacky rigging season starts when that water temperature starts to get up sort of in the mid fifties. That's when it's gonna begin, you know, sort of that mid to late pre-spawn period when those fish are first starting to move up. And the best times throughout the year, and we'll talk, you know, later, but the by far the premium time to fish a wacky rig is when the water gets to be in the mid fifties until it gets to be about 70 degrees. Now, depending upon what part of the country you're in, this could be anywhere between February to May. Um, you know, it depends on your latitude and longitude. But for most places across the country, the key wacky rig times are gonna be late March into mid-May. That's just the best time. That's when the fish, the way they're positioned, their mood, their personality, um, the things that generate strikes. Because one of the things that you're gonna find in bass fishing is in and around the spawn. When those fish get close to spawning, they don't really like to hit lures that move horizontal through the water column. They like baits that are more, uh, you know, subtle bottom baits. That's why your baits like your wacky rigs, shaky heads, <clears throat> Texas rigs, all that type of stuff work, work really good around the spawn. It's just sort of their, their mood and personality. So the first places that I look for when I'm fishing a wacky rig in the springtime, when that water temperature starts getting in the mid to upper 50s, up to 70, it's all about getting into the um, spawning areas or close to the spawning areas. So for the most part, I fish, unless it's a natural man-made lake where you don't have them in there, we'll talk about that here in a second. But if you're on a natural man-made lake where there's creeks and coves and all that type of stuff, I focus in the coves almost exclusively, you know, 100% of the time. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the fish that are moving into those spawning coves that are in three different phases. You're gonna have the pre-spawn fish that are sort of on their way in there. You're gonna have maybe some fish that are actually looking for beds or bedding that are maybe a little bit farther back in there. And then in the post-spawn, you're gonna have them all over the place. They're gonna be coming and going. Some of them are gonna be super shallow garden fry. Some of them are gonna be making their way uh, back out to the post-spawn staging areas. They can be all over in there. So the, one of the first things I do is I'll pick out maybe, you know, a dozen really good looking spawning coves on the lake. And I usually get in there and I start right at the mouth of them. And depending upon the cover that I have, I just start working my way back 
into the cove earlier in the spring. So like in March, when the water temperatures are still below 60, I'm usually starting out towards the mouth of the cove a little bit, and I'm fishing that wacky rig a little bit deeper. I'm letting it drop down into, you know, five or 10 foot of water, depending again upon the water clarity or the cover that I have. It's all relative to the cover, because say, for example, if you're fishing, you know, Lake Chickamauga, you know, you're, there's gonna be a lot of fish maybe that are staging around the boat dock, so you can, fish a wacky rig around the boat docks at the mouth of the cove, or you may have a lake that's got riprap bank. You could fish around riprap, or you can have some a lake that could have some shallow grass on it. But normally I'll stay in the first half of a cove, like from the point to halfway back in it. Now, and I'll fish a little bit deeper. Now, once those fish are actually, the water temperature is closer to 60, and those fish are actually getting closer and closer to bedding, that's when I start moving, you know, from halfway back into the cove toward all the way back in there. And I move up a little shallower. Instead of fishing five to 10, I'm usually fishing one to five. And again, fishing whatever cover is available. If it's bare rock, I'm just casting, you know, fan casting the bare rock. If there's targets there, I'm trying to hit the targets. Every situation is gonna be unique with the, uh, you know, structure that you have. But the main thing, the point of it is, is you can't really go wrong with, um, fishing slow and fishing the entire cove with it because you could possibly pick them up anywhere. And this is a, this is especially important if um, you've got days that don't have much wind where you can really fish it nice and slow. Now I'll tell you one little, one little tip of advice here is if you're looking for fish, say for example, you want to go catch them on a wacky rig. One of the, one of the best ways to locate fish to catch on the wacky rig better than anything else is look for them with a shaky head because shaky head, you can fish a little bit faster in the little bit deeper water. And if you start getting a few bites on a shaky head, you can almost always come back through that same water, you know, with the wacky rig and fish slower and even catch more with it. Now, in those situations, most of the time, um, earlier in the pre-spawn, I'm using the green pumpkins and the watermelons. It seems like they work a little bit better, but once those fish start getting, um, and I'm using the full size, you know, for the most part, the full size stick bait. Once those fish start getting closer to spawning, that's when I transition over to the more of the shad patterns and the smaller ones out there. So I'll go to the four inch models, or maybe I'll go to the trick worm, something like that. Um, a little bit more finessey. And then after those fish, if I feel a lot of the fish have already spawned and they're garden fry or they're working their way back out to the main lake, that's when I go to the bright colored floating worm, like the trick worms, like the bright yellows and chartreuses like that. You will find that the best bite on the bright colored wackies are after the fish have spawned. They're, they're a little bit more aggressive then, they're a little bit more hungry, and they go for that little bit faster presentation with that. But the spawning coves are the whole deal with that, um, if you have a man-made lake. Now, if you're in a lake that um, is a natural body of water that's got, uh, you know, grass or vegetation, which is associated with natural bodies, it's sort of the same deal, except a lot of times you're not fishing coves, you're fishing spawning flats. Because on natural lakes, you, a lot of them don't have coves, they just got shallow flats that are protected a little bit more, and that's what you're looking for there. I mean, for example, if you're fishing, you know, the Potomac River in Maryland, you know, you can catch them on sand flats on the main lake, like in behind the grass beds or around lily pad stems or something like that. If you're fishing in Florida, you know, where you've got lots of aquatic vegetation, you're fishing, you know, basically on those spawning flats in there, some, some of the backwaters maybe, you know, some of the areas that have um, filtration and have a little bit cleaner water. Hard bottoms is another big key that time of year. Um, and if you're fishing lakes like in Texas in there, you're, that's when you're usually fishing a little bit deeper over the submergent hydrilla and milfoil with that. One thing about uh, fishing in Texas that I found about fishing wacky rigs <clears throat> is I've always done better there in the pre-spawn period when I can fish that wacky rig in those little bit deeper flats. Um, it seems like when those fish start actually bedding that um, I'll do better with just pitching, flipping creature baits and Texas rigs around. So that's gonna be the big deal in the springtime of the year. Now, once, once you start moving out of the spring into the, you know, the early summer period, the early summer period, all the way through the rest of the fall, you can still catch them on a wacky rig, but it drops off and, it, and your, the options that you have as far as cover goes, they sort of get more limited. 
the things that I look for in the summertime and the fall time with wacky rig fishing is shallow cover in a little bit more off colored water. You, one of the things that you'll find out about wacky rig fishing is you want to stay in the cleanest water that you can find during the spring, during the pre-spawn, spawn and post-spawn. And once you start getting into June, July, August, September, October, that type, that type of stuff, that's when you need to go to the, the more stained water areas and fish shallow cover that is, um, a lot of times isolated covers better. Probably my favorite structure to fish a wacky rig on in the summer and fall is around boat docks. But wacky rigs are great around boat docks and warm weather out there. Um, just basically skipping them up, up under the docks into the shade. They're really good if you got piling docks, like, you know, guys like fishing Lake Norman and Gunnersville that not, that where they're not the floating docks, but they're the pile docks. Um, that's one of the first things that I look for. The other piece of cover that's really, really good is any type of stump or wood. Cypress trees are great. If you guys have cypress trees in the lake that you're fishing, you can catch them all summer long around cypress trees on a wacky rig or around stumps, shallow visible stumps, shallow wood. There's something about off-colored water and wood that's going to be your primary structures during the summer months. It's, they just don't really get around the, the rock and the cleaner water that time of year. Now, a lot of it just depends, too, on the species of bass that you're fishing. Because if you guys are fishing up north for smallmouth up there, that's a different type of fish. Personally, I have never done that great on fishing straight smallmouth lakes with a wacky rig. Seems like I do a little bit better with the drop shots and the Ned rigs and that type of stuff than I do with the wackies. Although I have caught them on it, it's not, not to say they won't bite it, but um, wackies in general for me have been more productive with largemouth and spotted bass. But anyway, guys, that's just a sort of an overview. It's a really simple technique. It's not like, you know, we can sit here and talk for hours about it because it's a basic, easy way to catch fish. I mean, a wacky rig is a great way. If you, if you have somebody that doesn't fish very often, and you can get them around some fish. A wacky rig is a really great technique for somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience to fish because they don't really have to do much to it. As long as they can make a cast out there and let it sink, they can watch their line swim out. And that's that's usually the way that you get the bite. Most of the wacky rig bites that you get, guys, you'll be fishing out there. It'll be float. It'll be on its way down, and all of a sudden, it'll just feel like the bait lifted up a little bit off the bottom and you'll just see your line swimming out with you. A um, couple other things with it on a, let's talk about the hook set. I forgot to mention that before. Um, don't ever set the hook on a wacky rig. What you want to do is when you get the bite, I'll sort of demonstrate it here. This is, it doesn't really make sense because you got a bare hook, but I can tell you this from, uh, you know, just my own personal experience with it is when, when you know you got one on, Say, say you cast out there and you, you know your line's moving out with it. Just start, just start um, reeling fast. Just pull back into it and just and just start reeling. You don't want to like reach down and set the hook like that. You know, watch your line move out with it and then just start reeling and pulling back like that. And keep reeling. Keep that pressure on the fish and it will keep burying the point of that hook in the fish's mouth as you're reeling it. Um, that's. I, it, it doesn't make sense because when you're talking about a bear hook like that, you think that you would hook them every time, but for, for whatever reason, I do a lot better on just the uh, pulling and reeling instead of straight setting the hook. But anyway, guys, um, like I said, it, it, a lot of you guys that are watching the video since it's an advanced channel, I'm sure you're familiar with it. That's just a few of the things that have helped me as far as the tips over the years on these wacky rigs. And it's, it's a fun way to catch them, man. It's, it's one of those techniques that it's it's a maximizing technique. You can catch a lot of fish on a wacky rig. You can catch giants on a wacky rig. You can, you know, I've had a lot of days on a wacky rig where I've caught 50 or 75 fish and I've caught some big ones too on it. And um, it's just one of the funnest baits to fish out there. I love getting, love getting bit on it. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the seminar and we'll see you guys next week. See.